Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to, Moab, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Thank you so much. I, I would just listen to you tell the whole story. I'm not sure why I'm here, but I am, so I will, I'll jump in. Well, as Pastor Wally said, uh, my name is John. I am a, an alumnus of Roberts in Northeastern, and I'm sure that a lot of people get to speak here that graduated from here, but I want to tell you a little bit about why this is such a huge honor, and Pastor Wally, I, I deeply appreciate the invitation. Um, it's because of kind of some of what I've gone through and what we're going to talk about today. September 21st, 2001, I know a lot of you guys were like 12, and that makes me really sad. No, you're probably, you're like two. I don't know. You're young. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how 20 years has gone by since my freshman year. It will happen to you too, so don't judge me too much right now. But September 21st, 2001, I was asked, uh, told to leave the college. Um, I don't have time to go into a whole story other than to tell you I had a pretty long-term problem with alcohol, and it was a very well-deserved dismissal. Uh, they were so key on me leaving that they, like, threw out all the rules about you only get this much money back for their classes. They're like, take the money, just go, just get off of our campus. And I remember that moment so clearly. It was a devastating moment, and here's why. I felt like the people that made that decision, like the college in general, gave up on me because they didn't think there was anything worth redeeming in me. They didn't think there was anything good to the point that they said, just go, please go, please leave, pack up your things, and get off of our campus. Um, I joked yesterday in our staff meeting that the odds of me ever getting to do this at that moment were about 10,000 to one, and uh, a colleague of mine who worked for Roberts at the time said, oh, it's way higher than that. The number was way, way higher than that. But here's what I learned. I learned a couple things. 
One, I actually learned that those, so those two people who are now friends of mine and Roberts in general did not do that because they thought there would be no good in me, that there was nothing worth redeeming. In fact, I believe that they did that because they felt that there was good there and that that adversity would actually bring that out, that I needed someone to stand up and say, no, we've let you go enough. Now you're going to face the consequences. I needed someone to help me fit or hit that low moment. And that was still to this day, probably the lowest moment of my life. But here's what I've learned with the benefit of hindsight and with time and what we're going to talk about with the story of Naomi and Ruth today. Frequently, the best parts of our story grow out of the most painful parts of our past. Frequently, that's what happened. Now, some of you already know that. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you will experience that. But you will find that frequently the best parts of our story grow out of the hardest parts of our past. And it's told so beautifully in the book of Ruth. Now, the book is called Ruth, but Naomi, I think, is really the main character. And appropriately, Naomi did a wonderful job uh, sharing that story with us. And I just want to tell you that story. I want to pull a couple things out of there this morning. So as you heard, we're talking about somebody named uh, Naomi, and her husband's name is Elimelech, which is a really fun name to say. And if we had more time, I would let you all say it with me. And they were in Bethlehem. But they had to go to Moab because there was this famine. And so Naomi and Elimelech and their sons, Malon and Kilion, they all go to Moab because there's a famine and they're thinking life might be better for us here. But they get there and pretty quickly Elimelech dies. So now Naomi finds herself as a widow. And then ten, uh, her sons, Malon and Kilion, they go on to marry two women named Orpah. And your brain wants to say Oprah every time you read that, but it's not. They're flipped. It's Orpah and Ruth. So now her husband is dead, but she has these sons and their wives to help protect her and provide with her. And so life is not great, but it continues on. But then 10 years after that, both of her sons die. And we don't know how they died. We don't know what happened to any of these three men, just that they died. And it's this devastating series of losses, just this devastating series of losses to where she has a husband, she has sons, she has this family, and then all three of the men in her life die. And it's just her and her two daughters-in-law. Now, being a widow at that time, was not a great situation. And it's not a great situation now, but at that time, you basically had two options. You were either completely ignored or you were taken advantage of. There really wasn't any third road. There wasn't a really good positive outcome to being a widow at that time. You were ignored or you were taken advantage of, and it was pretty much a guarantee that you would live in poverty. And so that's her life. But she hears the famine in Judah where she's from is over. And so she makes the decision to go back to where she is comfortable, to go back home. And she sets out with Orpah and Ruth. But as you heard in some of the interactions, she, she attempts to send them back. And she makes some pretty good arguments and says, just go, go back. You stay with your people. I'll go back to my people. Let's just call this whole thing off because clearly it's not going that well. And weeping, Orpah leaves, but Ruth decides to stay and makes that beautiful profession of loyalty and of love to her mother-in-law where she says, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And where I die, or where you die, I will die too. And Naomi accepts that. And they go forward, Naomi and Ruth, to Bethlehem. Uh, but Naomi makes one change in there right at the end of chapter one where she says, Naomi means pleasant. And that's no longer appropriate for my name, so please call me Mara, which means bitter. And if your name is Mara, I hope it's not Hebrew and that you're not offended by that, but that was what she said. She's like, don't call me Naomi anymore, just call me bitter, because I left Bethlehem full, with a full life, with a full family, with a picture of what my life was going to be, and now I'm coming back empty, so just call me bitter. It's a pretty good insight as to where she stood in life at that point. But they go back, Naomi and, and Ruth, they go back and they arrive just as barley harvesting season was beginning, which who doesn't love a good barley harvesting season, right? That's a good time. We all look forward to that. Um, so Ruth decides she's going to go out to the fields and she's going to glean there is what it's called. So when the wheat and barley were harvested, they would, they would cut and bundle the stalks and 
Israelite law demanded that the corners not be harvested, that they don't cut it too close to the edges, and that if something was dropped, it was left for the poor, and that was called gleaning. It's kind of like growing up when your mom used to make cakes or brownies, and she had the bowl, right, and you wanted her to leave some of the corners of the bowl. My mom would clean that bowl completely out and then hand it to me. I'm like, I can't do anything with this. Gleaning was kind of like that. It was when they left some stuff in the bowl, they left some barley there for people, and it was kind of a way of providing for the the poor. They had to go out and gather that, but they got to keep that food, and that's a way that they were taken care of. So she goes out to do that in the field, and it's at that point in the account that we learn that Elimelech, he had a relative who is called an important man of standing, which is a really cool title. If somebody doesn't change your Instagram bio to man of standing today, I'm going to be a little disappointed. That's a good one to put in there. And so this man of standing, his name is Boaz, and Boaz comes riding in, and this is like his whole area, and he looks over and he sees this new woman, and he asks like, who is that? Who is that girl? Who's that woman? Who does she belong to? And the foreman of the, crew, the group there, he said, she came from Moab with Naomi, and she asked if she could glean. He said, I'll tell you what, she is a hard worker. She's been working hard. And so Boaz goes over and he tells Ruth, listen, don't go to anybody else's field. Stay in my fields. You'll be safe here. The men will not bother you. I will make sure that you stay safe. And she asked, what have I done to find such favor? Why would you just come over and seek me out and ask me to stay here and say that you would protect me? And he said, I've heard about all that you've done for your mother-in-law. I've heard about the love that you've shown, and I want you to be richly rewarded for that love. And so at mealtime, he feeds her all that she wants. He lets her take leftovers. And Boaz kind of says to the guys that are working, hey, guys, just drop a little bit extra. You know, leave a little extra for her. Make sure that she's taken care of. And so she gleans all day, spends a full day gleaning, and she gets an ephah, which is about three-fifths of a bushel or about five and a half gallons of barley, which when you're picking up the scraps is a lot. Five and a half gallons of barley is a whole lot. It's like sending your kids out trick-or-treating. They come back with a wheelbarrow. And you're like, what neighborhood did you go to? And so Naomi, she asked that question. When she comes back, she's like, well, where have you been? Where have you been that you've got that much barley? And she's like, I don't know, some guy named Boaz. Like, he was really nice, and he told me he'd keep me safe. And Naomi says, oh, Boaz. Yeah, he's a close relative. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. Stay close to him. You may not be safe in just any field, but you will be safe in the field with Boaz. Now, kinsman redeemer is probably not a thing that, that you have. You're like, I had an uncle and an aunt, like some cousins, no kinsman redeemer. That's a relative who volunteered to take responsibility for their extended family. Uh, so if a husband dies, the kinsman redeemer could be his brother. But if it wasn't the brother, it would move down the succession of relatives till somebody took kind of ownership and responsibility to help provide for those relatives. And they didn't have to marry her, but if they all chose not to, again, it was very likely that she was going to be subject to lifelong poverty. And so we know that there's a relationship here, that Boaz has that relationship with Elimelech where he could be the kinsman redeemer. So in our account, time goes on, it's maybe three months, and Naomi begins to worry about Ruth and how Ruth will be provided for long term. She's not going to live forever. What is going to happen with Ruth? And she says, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. And she reminds her of Boaz. You remember Boaz, right? Our kinsman redeemer. She tells her, go get all dressed up. This is such a, a motherly thing to do. Go get dressed up and pursue Boaz. Go out there and see what happens. And she she does that. It's a weird thing, and it involves feet, and you can read it later if you want to, but we're going to keep moving. Um, but when she does, when she pursues Boaz, and she says, hey, you know, you could be my kinsman redeemer, he says, you know, that's so sweet. You are so sweet. You haven't run after all these younger guys. There's younger guys than me around here. You haven't done that. Everyone knows the kind of high character woman that you are, but there's actually somebody in line before me as your kinsman redeemer. As we work down the succession line, there's somebody before me who could be your kinsman redeemer. He said, I'll go see him in the morning. And if he wants to redeem you, that's fine. But if he's not willing to do it, as surely as the Lord lives, I will. And so Ruth comes back home and Naomi's waiting up at the table and she's like, how did it go? She says, well, and she tells her the story and Naomi says, let's wait and see because Boaz will not rest until it's settled. 
And she was right. Boaz goes to the town gate and he waits for this guy. He gathers some witnesses together so there's no discrepancies about what was said and what was decided and he waits for this other relative to come through. And when he does, comes by and he says, hey, sit down, I have a little business to talk to you about. You remember Naomi? She came back from Moab. Well, she is selling some land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. And um, I was gonna suggest that if you wanna buy the land, go ahead. But if, if not, if you're not gonna buy it, I'm next in line. And the relative's like, oh, land, cool, I'll take it. And Boaz was like, oh, okay, that's great, really good. Um, hey, one thing, also in addition to the land, uh, you have to marry Ruth. And did I mention her mother-in-law, Bitter? Uh, yeah, Bitter, that's, uh, it used to be Naomi, now she wants to go by Bitter. You get them too, this is the package deal. And the relative is like, oh, yeah, the land, right. Uh, never mind, actually, I don't wanna do that. It might endanger my own estate. He said, you go ahead and do it. And so Boaz says to the witnesses, you are all my witnesses that I bought from Naomi all of this property. And to keep the name of the dead with the property, I will also marry the Moabite woman, Ruth, Malion's widow. And so Ruth and Boaz, they get married and she gives birth to a son. Now Naomi's friends, they see this and they praise the Lord for the incredible way that he has redeemed her situation and her life. They were watching, they knew what she'd been through. They see her there with her new, her daughter-in-law's new husband and the baby. And they say in chapter four, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law loves you and has given birth. And the pastor says that Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. And if you know any grandmas, that's all that they're really looking for out of life is just to take the child and, and hold them. And Naomi had this moment. And this story, this account is an incredible story of redemption and it's a story of hope. It's a journey that was lived by Naomi and Ruth that took them from this devastating series of losses to new love and ultimately to new life. Now Boaz and Ruth, they named their son Obed. And Obed, he has a son who he names Jesse. And Jesse has a son named David in Bethlehem. And God's greatest source of renewal ever would be born through that same line, through the line of Ruth and Boaz and Obed and Jesse and David, through him in Bethlehem. God's greatest source of renewal ever would be born the source of life, the source of new life, the source of eternal life, Jesus would be born. He came to renew humanity. He came to restore humanity, and he came to redeem it. Because our God is a God of redemption. The Bible is full of stories like this. I am a story of redemption. Some of you are a story of redemption. Some of you may be a story of redemption very early on in the process. But those are the kind of stories that God writes through our life. Because frequently, as I told you up top, the best parts of our story begin with the hardest parts of our past. The parts that we wish never would happen. The parts that if we were in control, we would have stopped. I can't tell you how much I pleaded with God to not let this happen. To say, God, I've got it. I've got the message. Just let me stay in school and finish up my degree. I promise. I'll take it from here. But Naomi, once broken, once empty, once left so desolate, so dark and depressed that she asked people to call her bitter, has now found new life. I want you to know very clearly this morning that a loss is not the end of your story. A loss is not the end of your story. I want you to hang on in faith to know that when things happen that are out of your control, things that you want to avoid, things that you wish you could have avoided, that a loss is not the end of your story. I love that section in chapter four, verse 15, where her friends say, he will renew your life and sustain you. And I think that promise was for Naomi and that was a reflection of her life, but I think that is a promise for us when we cling to God and to what God wants to do in our story. But it's important that we don't miss this part because when we look at Naomi's life, our Elimelech, our Malion, our Kilion, are they alive again? Have those lives that were tragically ripped away from her prematurely, have they somehow been restored? And of course, the answer is that they haven't because sometimes God heals. Sometimes he cures. Sometimes he completely restores. Our God has the power to do that. One of the pastors that was at Northgate, the church where I worked for a long time, he would always say, he'd be praying, and he'd say, God, you know, we don't know what you wanna do, but we would be absolutely nuts to not ask you to heal them because we know God has the power to heal and to cure and to restore like that. And sometimes he does. 
But we know all too well that it's not always that way. We know that it doesn't always end that way. So maybe renewal won't look exactly how you wanted it to look. It probably won't look like it did before the brokenness. But he will redeem your situation and he will renew your life because our God is a God of redemption and a God of renewal. But there's a difference between being restored and renewed. There's a big difference between that. In November, I had the really exciting experience of hitting a pretty large buck that most people would have been happy to shoot with my car. I was not happy to hit it with my car um, because it left my car in a severely different state than it was moments before I hit the deer. But if you've ever done that, you take it to the shop, right? And thousands of dollars and the miracle of the insurance that you pay for every month later, I went and I got the car and it was restored. It looked exactly the same as it did before I hit the deer. Probably a little nicer because most of the body was new and freshly painted. And the car had been restored and I looked at it and I said, yes, that's my car. That's what it looked like before we hit the deer. And that's how we want our lives to be. Can we be honest and say that that's how we want our lives to be? We want things to go back to the way that they were before. We want to go back to the way it was before the death of somebody that we loved. We want to go back to the way it was before the heartache that still seems to haunt us. We want to go back to the way that things were before we made decisions that took things off course in a way that we never anticipated. And we fall in love with that picture of restoration of what it was before. But restoration does not always come in our lives. It doesn't. It didn't come for Naomi. It doesn't always come for us. But here's what I want for you. Don't miss out on the blessing of the renewal because you're so focused on the lack of restoration. Don't miss out on the picture that God has painted through the renewal because it's not restored to the picture that you had before that happened. Don't miss out on that because what if Naomi had been so caught up in the pain of the losses that she had endured that she missed out on the blessings of the love of Ruth or the love of Ruth's new husband, Boaz, or her grandson, Obed? What if she was so caught up in the pain that it wasn't restored to exactly how it was before that she totally missed the blessing of the renewal and the redemption that God had put in her story. I don't want you to miss out on that. I remember going through and just trying to reason with God and saying, God, just, you know, let this happen. Let me get back. Let me graduate with my class the way it was supposed to be. I'm a senior. I was 24 credits from graduation. Really cool thing about getting kicked out. I wouldn't recommend this uh, for a variety of reasons, even though it did turn out well for me. You don't get the degree, but the student loans still start, which is really cool because then you got to start paying those, but you don't have a job from the degree. So it's one of the many reasons I wouldn't recommend doing that. But I remember going through and saying, God, no, this is the picture that we had. We've got to get back to this picture. And God was saying, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to restore it, but I am going to redeem it. And I look back now and I look at an opportunity, a ministry opportunity at Pierce that actually got me into pastoral ministry. I look at meeting my wife who was a freshman when I was doing my second senior year. So I could have missed that if I, uh, if I didn't have to come back. I look at the things that God did. I look at the picture that he painted and it makes me so glad that somehow in his wisdom, he helped me move through the lack of restoration so that I could be present in the renewal and the redemption. I want you to know this morning that the bigger the brokenness in your life, the greater the opportunity for God's grace to work. That the more you're saying, they're saying, yeah, that's fine, I understand that, but. No, the bigger it is, the more opportunity God has to work. No matter what wounds, no matter what brokenness, no matter what hurts you carried in today, God will renew your life and sustain you if you will let him. If you will let go of the brokenness, if you will let go of this picture that you have of what things looked like before that, and you will trust that he is, and he will continue to be a good God who redeems us and who renews us and who will sustain us. Because my God, our God, is a God of redemption, and he is a God of renewal. Let me ask you to pray with me. Father God, I pray for the stories that are being written in this room right now. Lord, for the stories that are being written on this campus. God, some of them are going exactly how they pictured. But God, not all of them are. Lord, there have been losses, there have been brokenness, there have been pain, there have been hurts. And God, especially for those stories, for those people, Lord, I pray this morning that you will give them the courage to hang on in faith. That you will show them that that loss is not the end of their story and that God, when we can trust you, 
when we can let go of this picture of what things were going to look like and we can trust this picture of what you are going to do through the brokenness, that God, you will renew us. Lord, you will sustain us. Lord, you will paint a beautiful picture through the brokenness of our lives. So God, may we lean heavily on you, especially in those moments where we are so aware of the fact that we are not in control, that this story is not only being written by us. And God, we trust you with that. We trust you with what you want to do in each and every one of our lives. So Lord, help us to walk closely with you and to seek that plan and to when it doesn't go how we want, to continue to walk closely with you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you to stand. Thank you, Wally. My prayer for you as you go is that those things won't just be something that washed over you, but that you will believe deep within your heart that a loss is not the end and that God will renew you and he will sustain you if you allow him to work through your brokenness. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great rest of your day.